This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a highly acclaimed and beloved actress whose many movie credits include The Initiation of Sarah, The Seduction, Deadly Illusion, Mob Boss, Naked Gun 33 and a Third, Venus Rising, The Nana Project, and our almost completely true love story co-starring Mariette Hartley and Jerry Soroka, who recently appeared on our show. And on TV, she created the iconic roles of Jennifer Pace Phillips on Search for Tomorrow, Constance Weldon Carlisle on Flamingo Road, for which she got a Golden Globe Award nomination, Jordan Roberts on Falcon Crest, for which she received a Soap Opera Digest Award nomination, Julia St. Martin on Murphy Brown, for which she earned a Primetime Emmy Award nomination, Sydney Chase on The City, Sophia Blakely on Fashion House, and Angelica Devereaux on Days of Our Lives, for which she received a Daytime Emmy Award nomination. And let's not forget that she was the original Jenna Wade on Dallas. She also guest starred on the most popular TV shows, including Mork and Mindy, Roseanne, Friends, Happy Days, The Bob Newhart Show, Police Woman, Kojak, Murder, She Wrote, and dozens more. She's appeared in some great miniseries too, including The Dream Merchants, Too Old to Die Young, and North and South Parts 1 and 2. And most recently, she co-starred with Donna Mills, Nicolette Sheridan, and two of my friends who recently appeared on our show, Lonnie Anderson and Linda Gray, in a delightful TV movie entitled Ladies of the 80s, A Diva's Christmas, co-written by Stan Zimmerman, who appeared on our show last week. On stage, our guest starred in the off-Broadway play Geniuses, which was named by Time Magazine and the New York Times as one of the top 10 plays of 1983. But our guest is much, much more than a talented, beautiful, and glamorous Hollywood star. She's an extremely dedicated and highly respected humanitarian. She's been in the forefront as an outspoken and dedicated advocate in the fight against AIDS, the pro-choice movement, and many environmental issues. In fact, she helped found the Environmental Communications Office, which fosters education and activism among entertainment industry professionals. And somehow, on top of everything else she's done, she found time in the 80s to write a book providing beauty tips, and she's also on the board of directors of SAG-AFTRA. I am delighted and deeply honored to welcome Morgan Fairchild to our show. Ms. Fairchild, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> I've got to correct a couple of those, but uh, one is that I'm no longer on the SAG after board, so I was not part of it during the last strike, just, just so your viewers won't be confused. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for clarifying that. I read that your mother enrolled you in acting classes when you were a young child because you were too shy to give a book report in class. Is that right? Oh, yeah, that's very true. I was uh, one of those teacher's pets. I was always in advanced placement classes, and I would get straight A's and never open my mouth. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I uh, I was just too shy. And uh, at one point, uh, when I was about uh, 10, my, uh, my um, fifth grade teacher decided that we all had to make oral book reports. And I was good at the writing part, but the oral book report, I stood in front of the class three days in a row and nothing would come out. <laughs> so my mother, coming a fam family of attorneys and debaters, said, no child of mine is not going to be able to stand up and talk. So she enrolled us in, in acting class. My sister and me, my sister loved it, and I would throw up every Saturday before we had to go. <laughs> so, oh, but boy, the whole world is glad you overcame that. Oh well, thank you. When thank I was you. doing my <laughs> I hope <laughs> when I was doing my research for this interview, I read that when you were just starting out, you were Faye Dunaway's double in Bonnie and Clyde. What was that experience like? You know, because I'd been doing theater for so long already, because I did start in the theater when I was 10 after the acting class, my sister and I kind of rapidly started working around Dallas. Uh, yeah, so uh, one day the owner of the local soundstage, where a lot of commercials and things that I shot were shot, uh, called up as I was walking out the door to open a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. I'm 16 years old. He calls and says, hey, you want to be in a movie? And I said, oh, sure, sure. He says, OK, we'll be at the North Park Inn tomorrow morning at nine, at uh, 5 a.m. And I said, the theater person, I said, 5 a.m.? I'm opening a show tonight. <laughs> so... 
But I said, okay, okay. So I get there in the dark at 5 a.m. in November in Texas, and nobody seems to know what's going on. They finally put us all on a bus and take us out to the middle of nowhere, Texas, which growing up in Texas, I can tell you, nowhere is really nowhere. <laughs> Nothing around, oh, just fields, a few trees, dirt roads, and they disgorge us there. And I have no idea what to do. I'm a kid, you know, first movie. So I said, what do we do? And so somebody said, well, why don't you go walk down that road and go look at the set? And I said, OK. So I start walking down in the dark. They give me a little flashlight and I'm walking down in this dirt road in the dark in the middle of nowhere. And I'm not seeing anything. And so finally, I see as the sun is coming up, I see this guy shuffling toward me, hands in the pockets, head down, kind of very James Dean poster looking. And so I said, hey, uh, can you tell me where the set is? And he looked up and said, why, yes, I'll show you where the set is. And it was Warren Beatty at 28, the most glorious thing you've ever seen with the sun coming up behind. <laughs> and so uh, so I went down and it was actually the set where later in the movie, if anybody has seen the movie, which a lot of people probably have because it's a classic, but it was uh, where uh, Dub Taylor, uh, Michael J. Pollard's character's father, uh, they go to visit him. And it was that scene. That's the one they were shooting that day. Wow. Who were your role models or mentors when you were first starting out as an actress? Well, ro role models and mentors are kind of two different things. I always had people that I admired their work. But uh, mentors, uh, my sister and I were very, very fortunate that we started off at a theater called Theater 3 in Dallas, which is still there. But at that time, it was owned by a husband and wife. And a lot of equity actors who had gotten, um, you know, one reason or another ended up in Dallas were working there. And so even though it wasn't an equity theater, it was a wonderful theater. And uh, Norma and Jack Alder were our mentors and a wonderful actor named Larry O'Dwyer, who was one of the most brilliant performers I've ever worked with. In fact, back in the 80s, you know, in 90s, people would say, you know, who are the most brilliant people you'd work with? And I'd say, well, Robin Williams and Larry O'Dwyer. And you've never heard of Larry O'Dwyer, but he's as good as Robin Williams. In fact, when I got Mork and Mindy, the reason I could improvise with Robin so well is because I grew up in the theater with, with uh, Larry. And he was one of the great improvisational actors <laughs> in the world. And so you kind of learn to be on your feet. But, uh, you know, so they were great mentors of, of ours, both of my sister and me. I'm, I'm forever grateful to have grown up with that experience because it stood me in good stead to this day. You know, a lot of uh, movie and TV people who haven't had theater experience, it's, uh, it's a bit challenging for them to try to go do theater. But the basics that I learned at that theater as a kid and as a teenager uh, really have stood me in good stead. And my sister got a full scholarship to Juilliard and she was saying after her first year, she says, you know, theater three gave us, you know, more, more hard training than I'm getting here. <laughs> Can you recall the most important career advice you ever received? Well, a couple of them, Larry O'Dwyer, the gentleman I was just, mentioning when I was shooting Bonnie and Clyde, I was working on a show with Larry too. And I came in one day, we, we had our dinner break and I, you know, I was sort of seeing what happened with the movie set and, you know, and I, I realized that I'd fallen in love with movies. I wanted to do movies, but the lifestyle was not something that I thought I could deal with. And so we were walking back and Larry said, you know, something's up with you. What's going on? And I said, you know, well, I was at this, cast party the other night and there was a lot of stuff going on that I, you know and and I walked out of it and you know but I'd like to do this for my career but you can't just keep walking out on life you can't walk out on reality of what it is and he just looked at me best piece of advice I ever got he said nonsense you can always walk out on reality wow and that's how I've survived in Hollywood <laughs> Is that best piece of advice I ever got? <laughs> when you say walk out on reality, are you talking about staying grounded? Well, at that moment, I was talking about just the insanity of the business. But in in reality, the thing I've done in Hollywood is I just create my own reality. If you don't stay grounded and you don't have your own reality in this town, it will eat you alive. And uh, I've seen so many friends and people I started out with who went down not so great roads one way or another. And, you know, it'll eat you alive. So that's it's very important 
uh, in life, but also in my crazy business to uh, know who you are, know what you believe in and and not be willing to sacrifice your ideals for for momentary success. That's really why I asked you about role models and mentors, because it seems to me that if someone's just starting out and they've achieved a great deal of success and they're not emotionally ready for it, wouldn't it be really helpful to have a mentor like you, for example? You're a seasoned veteran in this business. You understand all the pitfalls. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, when I got out here, I didn't necessarily have mentors like that that I turned to for advice, although sometimes I did. Roddy McDowell was a great friend of mine, and he I, I would talk to him because he'd just been in the business forever. And he would always give good advice. I remember I was on a show. I was not real thrilled with the show, but it was a big hit show. And I was thinking of trying to get on my contract. And Roddy said, don't ever get off a hit. <laughs> don't ever get off a hit. <laughs> so, but, uh, but he was a great friend. And um, Natalie Wood was a dear friend. I did a miniseries with Natalie when I first got out here. And... Um, she was a wonderful, wonderful lady, and uh, I really treasured our friendship. When I got Flamingo Road, I, the first letter I got, because back then there was no email, you know, was a, a note from Natalie saying, oh, congratulations on your new series. And I said, yeah, guess what? We're opposite, <laughs> heart to heart. <laughs> so, <laughs> but she and RJ were always great. One of my early jobs when I first got out here was with Robert Wagner, and, you know, we've worked together several times over the years, but I treasure both of them. And, you know, and just the fact when you're new in town, you will always appreciate it when people you grew up watching treat you like a peer and like a professional and um, and treat you that way. And, and certainly they always were. I mean, these days it'd be nice. I'd love to help mentor young people, but I think young people seem so interested in it these days. <laughs> well, that's really unfortunate. Now, you spent four years on Search for Tomorrow, and many years later, you were on Days of Our Lives, The City, The Bold and the Beautiful, General Hospital. When Eric Braden was on our show, he said that soap opera stars work harder than any other actors, but they get the least respect within the industry. Do you agree with that? Well, yes. I mean, I mean, if you can do a daytime soap, you can do anything. Back when I started out on Search for Tomorrow, I mean, they taped it, but it was, I mean, unless the scenery fell in, it was going to be live. So you really learned to think on your feet and do things. But also back then, we had a lot of great theater actors uh, because that was shot in New York. And several of my co-stars were always doing, you know, Broadway, Tony Award winning things and stuff like that. So the soap opera was what paid for the kids' college or, you know, the country home or things like that. So you're working with really great seasoned professional. I considered myself very lucky. I mean, also, like even when I was doing search, I mean, I think Priscilla Lopez was doing Chorus Line and came on and did a few days on the show to pick up money. You know, Kevin uh, Cl uh, Kevin Klein was on the show with me. A lot of wonderful people. Joel Higgins, who went on to do Silver Spoons. A lot of wonderful people were on the show with me. I think Alec Baldwin, Demi Moore wanted after I was on. I may be not right about that, but I think so. And uh, for a young actor, I considered it a great training ground. I had done so much theater before I got that job, but I had, I'd only done a few films because Texas was a runaway production, uh, right to work state. So we had a lot of runaway production back then. And so I'd done a few movies, but I, to be honest, I wasn't sure what I was doing. And with Search, I would, I would tape the show and every lunch time I would go because our show came on, on uh, around lunch. I would go into the control room and I would watch the show. And I remember somebody came in there one day and said, you know, why are you watching our stupid show? You know, and I said, well, you know, I got married real young and I didn't go get to go to college too much. And if I'd gotten to go to SMU drama school, they would have taped me doing scenes and put me on film, and then I could see what I did wrong. And these people are paying me to do it. <laughs> so I would just watch every day. And that's how I learned how to do close-ups and how I learned to do things. Plus, I went to all the mo old movie retrospectives and really learned how to do close-ups from Marlena Dietrich and uh, Greta Garbo, Carol Lombard, all the old movie stars, you know. And, you know, but I, I, I learned a lot doing that. And so, and I, I treasure that time. And I, 
you know, I got to work with a lot of wonderful people. Now, when you're on the soaps, they're so rushed. It's a little harder. But I mean, everybody is so budget conscious now about everything. But they're always welcoming. And, and you know, I know in a couple of them, when I've gone in, they say, boy, you can do this. Not many primetime people can do this because we're really fast. And I said, yeah, I've done it my whole life. <laughs> so because also just being improvisational theater, you know, but uh, yeah, it is. It's very hard and they should get more respect because they work their tails off. And there's a lot of very talented people on a lot of these shows. And I've worked off and on with a lot of them. And and uh, they're they're a good group. They're uh, kind to work with. They're welcoming to new people and uh, always very supportive. And and it's very, very, very hard work. And, and if you can survive doing it, you can do anything. Yeah, that's really what a great training ground you had. Now, Miss Fairchild, you're one of the most instantly recognizable actresses in the world because of the many iconic roles you've created on television. I mentioned a lot of them in my introduction. Is there one role that you've played that comes closest to resembling the real Morgan Fairchild? Not really. <laughs> they never cast me that way. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's, you know, when I when I first got out to Hollywood, like my early TV movie, and please call me Morgan, please don't call me Miss Fairchild. We're buddies, Harvey, you know, call me Morgan. I my first TV movie I was up for and I was so excited and it was a rip off of the movie Carrie and and Kay Lenz, who was the queen of uh, uh, primetime stuff at that time, TV movies was the Carrie character. And uh, there were two other characters, her sister and the sorority queen. And her sister is torn between wanting to join the sorority and her love for her sister. So anyway, so I go in and read. They have me read for the sorority queen. And and the producer, Chuck Freeze, at that time, they could do this. Now you'd have to go through six months of uh, network and everything. But then he said, you got it. And I said, well, you know, I really like to read for the sister because I think she has more gray areas because she's torn. You know, he says, honey, you got this one. And I, he said, I, I said, well, could I read for it? No, I want to burn out. I said, I want to wait. No, he says, finally, he says, honey, you haven't been here very long, have you? And I said, no, sir, like three months. And he says, let me explain something to you. I can find a good ingenue anywhere, but a good bitch is hard to find. And if the bad guy doesn't work, nothing works. Think of Shane without Jack Palance. You know, if the bad guy doesn't work, nothing works. So, you know, you just get out there and have them do a rain dance around you. <laughs> so so I thought, well, you know, I mean, it's this little TV movie. Nobody's going to see this. And at least I'll have a TV movie, cre movie credit. And of course, it was the number one good TV movie of the year and started me on my road playing bitches. <laughs> and so... Well, so, you know, most people, a lot of times when I'm on sets, you know, after a few days, people will come over and say, you know, I was really kind of scared working with you, but you're so nice. <laughs> so you have that advantage going in that they're a little nervous about you. <laughs> but did it disturb you ever that you were always seem to be cast as a bitch when you're nothing like that at all in real life? Oh, no, honey, the bitch is always the best part. <laughs> and also, and they let me ad lib a lot, usually, and I ad lib a lot of one liners. And, you know, my ad libs are, are bitch one liners. They're not ingenue one liners. So. <laughs> no. I, and so I, uh, you know, I have uh, enjoyed doing it, but it's not much like me. You know, basically, I'm a science nerd. You know, I'm uh, counterterrorism. I have these odd hobbies, emerging viruses and epidemiology. And one is counterterrorism. I followed terrorist groups since the 70s. I come from a family of attorneys, but they never cast me as a doctor or an attorney or anything like that. You know, it's uh, it is what it is. I just remember when we were doing the wedding stuff on um, Friends and uh, one of the side stories, they had Gary Oldman coming in, playing a kind of uh, Errol Flynn, kind of my favorite year, like Peter O'Toole did uh, with a with Joey, like a movie with this over the top swordsman and all this stuff. And so I would go down and watch their rehearsals and. And Gary was hysterical. He was hysterically funny. And they edited it, you know, they cut a lot of it out for, for time, you know, because it's a half hour sitcom. But, you know, which, I mean, you lose Gary Oldman for time. But anyway, but they, but I, I've said to him, Gary, I mean, you're hysterically, you, you know, you should do more comedy. <laughs> he looked at me and he says, oh, darling, they never cast me that way. 
<laughs> so that's not just me. You know, everybody gets their niche, and it may not be what they see themselves all at all as at all. But you know, there it is. Well, then I have to ask you: of all the bitches you've played, do you have a favorite one? Oh, my favorite was Racine on Paper Dolls. And when I, I did a short-lived series in 84, and I loved Racine. She was, uh, uh, Eileen Ford run amok. It was a series about the fashion industry. And I just remember because they wanted me to do it, and it was after Flamingo Road had gotten canceled, and I didn't want to get typecast doing the primetime soaps and stuff. And <laughs> Len Goldberg had just split up with Aaron Spelling. It was Aaron Spelling Goldberg, you know, for a long time. And uh, he was producing it and he called and he said, I really want you to do it. And I said, can I send you the script? And finally, I said, okay, send me the script. So I look at the script and I called him back and I said, you know, Lynn, I, you know, it's, it's a fun show, but my character's just on the phone. She doesn't have any, any storyline. <laughs> She's just on the phone in this two hour movie. you know." And he said, I promise you, I promise you, if you'll do it, you'll get a storyline. I said, okay, can I do what I want with the, you know, with the, with the phone calls? And he said, okay, okay, you know. So I would just ad lib the hell out of these phone calls and just make them absurdly <laughs> funny. And, and they kept them all, you know, I would just ad lib everything. And then they put in a couple of scenes. And I remember I had one where I'm supposed to be going, we're going, we literally were going down Park Avenue and um, uh, Brenda Vaccaro and I are in the limo and, you know, she, all she is, is she's screaming at me because my, my, my character is the agent. Her, her daughter is like Brooke Shields uh, character and, and um, got caught with cocaine and I have managed her to keep from getting fired. She's suspended, but not fired from the cosmetic line. And Brenda's screaming at me and smoking and spring screaming. And, you know, so I'm just sitting there with my gloves, just waving, waving, waving the hand. And finally, she jumps out of the car in the middle of the street. And, you know, so I knew the scene was over. So if they didn't like it, they could cut it. I just said, you know, James, home. And if you can manage to hit Ms. Vaccaro on the way, big point. And, you know, and, and they kept it, you know, and they just kept a lot of that kind of thing. But. One of my interests is paleontology. I wanted to be a doctor or paleontologist when I was a kid. So while we were shooting this series, the pilot, I knew that there was going to be this big kind of major uh, exhibit at the Museum of Natural History in New York. And it was going to be all the major paleoanthropological uh, finds at that time. It's going to be Lucy and the first family and Littlefoot and all these different famous fossils, if you're interested in fossils. So I really wanted to go. So Lynn calls me up and he says, Morgan, I just realized you don't have any exterior scenes in New York, so you don't have to go. I said, Lynn, you've got to let me go because I want to go to this paleontology exhibit. <laughs> And he thinks I'm nuts, you know, but they wrote a scene for me where I think I, I come out of the plaza and say, where's my limo? Anyway, so I go to the paleontology exhibit and I'm going around looking at all these big things under plexiglass. And there's one very primitive skull under under plexiglass. And uh, these two guys are looking at it. And, and the cards are not very good. If you didn't know what you were looking at, you wouldn't know what you were looking at. And so they're saying, you know, what are those big cheekbones? You know, what is that thing on its head? You know, it's got this big thing on its head. And I said, well, that's called a sagittal crest. And the cheekbones are really wide like that because it's obviously chews a lot and the big muscles go up and attach to that to balance everything. And they're saying, oh, where do you see that? And I said, no, no, I, I, it's not here. It should be here, but I'm just telling you. And they looked at me and said, aren't you Morgan Fairchild? How do you know this shit? <laughs> I was like, well, because it's one of my hobbies, you know, but it was, you know, so that always kind of catches people off. But that's been one of the great joys of being in this business is get to travel a bit, see the world, you know, go to countries you might not have thought of going to or cities you might not have gone to and, and discovering other people and other cultures and what the rest of the world is like, which I, I'm glad more Americans are traveling now and getting to see the rest of the world a bit. Well, I love the fact that you surprise people, you know, whatever image they have of you. And because you're so beautiful, they may even have a preconception about what your personality is like. And you prove everybody wrong. You're not a bitch. You're very educated and you're very cultured and your your interests are extremely scientific. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of science. I mean, I wanted to be a doctor or a paleontologist, like I said, when I was a kid. So and I've just always tried to keep my hand in and 
you know, just very interested in viruses. And that's how when AIDS came along, I was had been tracking it for a while. When Rock Hudson got sick, I'm suddenly on Nightline explaining what a retrovirus is and how it works and things like that. So, you know, that's the odd thing, because I have these odd hobbies that you'd never sit around and talk to somebody on the set about because they would be bored to death. But like when Rock got sick, you suddenly realize that no, there was no other famous space that had the weird bit of knowledge that I might have that could go out and try to take the stigma off of it, of how you get it, and and take the stigma off the gay community. I mean, it happened to enter this country in the gay community, but it's not a gay disease. It's just a disease. And I testified before Congress for AIDS funding and explained that to them, uh, that it's just a disease, guys, and it's and it's going to affect all of us. And so, uh, you know, and indeed, uh, several women that I knew who had AIDS back in the 80s, they all got it from blood transfusions and stuff. So before they started testing the blood supply for it. So, you know, you feel like you have this moral obligation to get out there and and um, try to take the stigma off, try to educate people, try to talk to them about the reality of what's going on, because there was such a fear mentality. I don't know if you remember, but there was such a fear mentality in America at that time. Well, as a gay man who lived through the 80s, believe me, I remember, one of the reasons I so wanted to have you on our show was to highlight the work you've done on behalf of people with AIDS. It's nothing short of monumental, Morgan. You're a member of the Entertainment Industries AIDS Task Force. You're on the board of directors of AMFAR. You've spearheaded dozens of fundraising and educational events. And I just want to thank you publicly because I lived through that epidemic. I lost many friends and you were one of the first celebrities to educate the public. And it uh, it's not forgotten. Believe me. Oh, well, I, I appreciate that. I, you know, I think a, a lot of young people don't know what it was like back then in America, you know, and uh, I, it was a very hard time. And, you know, and I know I lost work because of it because I was controversial because of my stand on AIDS and everything. I mean, people would tell me that, you know, so, and uh, I know I had one, uh, one gay friend, a casting director who retired and we were out to dinner one night and with other friends and he started crying at the dinner table. And, and he said, Morgan, I know you lost work because I was casting director. I was in those rooms. And when your name would come up and they would say, Oh, she's too controversial with that AIDS stuff. He said, I didn't defend you. And I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. And I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't defend you. And, you know, but I I felt at that time that part of my job was to get out and take the hits uh, because I could actually have an intellectual conversation with people about stuff. And so to get out there and take the hit and then make it safe for other people to be behind me. And I, I just remember one friend of mine who was, uh, you know, West Coast publisher of one of the one of the magazines and he had called me up. I think rock was still alive. Maybe Uh, anyway, it was very early on. And he had called me up and said, "Uh, we want to do like this big picture of Hollywood fights AIDS. And we're trying to get together a group of celebrities. Will you come do it? And I said, of course. So he called me a couple of weeks later and he said, thank you. And I said, for what? And he said, everybody turned us down until you said yes. And that's how we got people, because you said yes. And that's how I kind of visualized my my fight in the 80s was, you know, being the one to be out there and take the first hit and make it safe for other people to say yes and talk about it. I'm going through sort of the same thing right now with long COVID, because, you know, I keep trying to educate people about COVID on my and long COVID on my uh, Twitter feed and everything and uh, social media stuff. So. Yeah, so it's the same thing now. People don't want to hear it, but long COVID is really bad. And the more times you catch COVID, the worse it's going to be. (laughs) Yes, that's very true. Now, in 1980, you co-starred in a wonderful miniseries called The Dream Merchants, directed by the legendary Vincent Sherman. He was a favorite of Betty Davis, Joan Crawford, many other cinematic legends. How did you like working with Vincent? I loved Vincent. Vincent was a piece of work. I loved Vincent. He was a doll. He was wonderful to work with and wonderful stories. And 
you know, uh, and and we had dinner for, uh, and lunch together for years after that till he got a little too old to to go out because he was already elderly. I think he finally died like at 101. And, and he would tell me old Hollywood stories. We just had a blast. I loved him. And of course, when you're a kid, I mean, growing up on old movies, when I heard I was going to get to work with Vincent Sherman, I was like, oh, my God, I've really arrived. <laughs> it's Hollywood. <laughs> oh, it really was. And I don't know how much you remember about the Dream Merchants, but you played a character by the name of Dulcie Warren, a rather unscrupulous and ultimately tragic actress. I just wondered if you based your portrayal of that character on anybody in particular. Um, well, I didn't. It was it was a TV movie of a Harold Robbins a novel, and he did a trilogy about Hollywood. Uh, the Dream Merchants was the first, the the Dream Merchants, the founders of Hollywood. And so this miniseries goes from like 1912 to 1928. So just fashion wise, it was amazing. You go from the organza with the embroidered big hats to, uh, you know, I'm a flapper in a in a chemise gown uh, doing a Charleston on the on the piano. <laughs> you know. So it was an interesting fashion wise, but he based it a lot. Um, one character is kind of obviously Louis B. Mayer, one is kind of obviously Irving Thalberg, one is kind of, you know, my character looks like it's Joan Crawford. So there were a lot of kind of recognizable archetypes there. And if you know the history of the movie business, you can kind of see the storylines and the characters as they're built and everything. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, I got to work with I got to work with Red Buttons and Kay Ballard and uh, Fernando Lamas and all these different stars. And Morgan Brittany was on it. We we were good friends and uh, we'd done we'd done initiation of Sarah together, too. So it was nice. I mean, Robert Goulet. I mean, I remember getting Robert Goulet and Carol Lawrence's autographs after seeing them do a, a a West Side Story, I think, you know, and uh, at the State Fair of Texas when I'm like 11, you know, and now I'm working with Robert Goulet, working with all these uh, great people. We had a great time. The costumes were fabulous. I mean, the guys even, this is when Warner Brothers still had a big costume department. So all these costumes went way back and the guys would get a costume. And of course, whoever it was originally made for is, is sewn in the label. You know, oh my God, this was made for Jimmy Stewart. You know, this was Clark Gable. You know, it's like, it was great. <laughs> You lived through such an era in Hollywood. Uh, did you ever get starstruck yourself? Not really, mainly because a lot of the of the people I grew up watching were welcoming, and you know, I like I I. Well, I mean, I can tell you stories. How long have we got? I can tell you stories for a while. Like I, I took the pilot of Hotel so I could have scenes with Betty Davis. And 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 everybody said, you know, Betty, oh man, she's like always on time. She's early. She's chewing the, the you know crew up for not being ready. Da 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 da. You know, she so and you know so blah blah blah. So we arrived. We're shooting uh, over in in one of the old sections of town with these gorgeous mansions and stuff. And I arrive and my trailer isn't there with my makeup and everything. I can't get ready. I'm sitting on the lawn at this home, waiting for my trailer to get there, knowing Betty Davis is gonna be waiting on me on the set. So, you know, finally the trailer gets there. I go and start slapping on all the goo and they take Betty in. Unfortunately, and Jim Brolin, she and Jim Brolin had the beginning of the scene so they could start the master without me. So I'm slapping the goo on. I'm terrified. I, I grab up all my junk. I go running in and Elaine Rich, the producer, uh, uh, Buddy Rich's daughter-in-law, uh, sister-in-law, uh, who was Aaron Spelling's pop producer for this. And she came over and said, OK, 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 uh, have you met her? And I said, well, I had been I had presented on the Oscars earlier that year and Betty had been backstage. And but she, you know, she's like this close to me, but, you know, just standing there chain smoking, never looks at me, never says hello. I'd been at a couple of big gala dinners where we were at the same table. We were introduced, but then she totally ignored me. And so. You know, she says, have you met her? And I said, uh, kind of. But yeah. And she said, well, let me introduce you. So I go over and she says, oh, Miss Davis is Morgan Fairchild. And she's, and, you know, how do you do, Miss Davis? I start to go put my stuff away. She says, and I've got something to say to you. Well, the whole set stopped. <laughs> you could hear a pin drop. <clears throat> I, I turned around with my junk in my arm. I turned around and I said, yes, ma'am. And she says, you are marvelous. And I'm like, Okay, well, oh, uh, that's very kind of you. I should go. And she says, and another thing, and she starts going down like everything I've ever done on film or television. And I, I was, 
I was kind of in shock and, and, you know, she's just going down and you did this and you did this. And I finally said, well, that, that's so kind of you, but that was not a very good, she says, but I saw what you were trying to do with it. And so, and then she would just follow. And then, you know, then we finally get to work and Elaine Rich comes over and says, me, she won't say good morning to, and you are marvelous. <laughs> so, but, uh, but then she just kind of followed me around all day. You know, it's like, what should I expect from these bastards? I've never done a series before, you know, so I start talking to her about things to look out for the way they'll try to screw you over, you know, and overtime, whatever. And, uh, you know, and she's just, you know, she, and we're just gabbing and, you know, she really, for some reason, really liked me. And at one point she looks up at me, and says, you know, you remind me of me when I stood up to Jack Warner. And I said, oh, no, Miss Davis, when you stood up to Jack Warner, you changed the business. <laughs> you know. But I remember at one point, because by this time, you know, she's older and she's tiny and she's kind of looking up at me and she's, how tall are you? And I said, five, four. And she says, me too. And I, I'm thinking maybe one day, <laughs> one time, but, but she was just so, so great and so funny. And we just became friends. And she, I remember they were giving her an AFI award, a women in film or something, women in film, I think it was. And they called me up and said, are you coming to this luncheon? And I said, oh, I'm going to try to get, she said, you know, Betty Davis says she's not coming. We're giving her an award, but she's not going to come unless you come. Please come. I said, OK, I'll come. <laughs> you know? But I was I was dating Johnny Carson at the time. And Betty had called up and she and Jimmy Stewart had done this HBO TV movie, early age, with, about an elderly couple that has a suicide pact. And they were going to have a screening at the Director's Guild. And she called and said she really wanted me to come. I said, and she really wanted me to come to this thing. So I said, OK, OK. So I come into the Director's Guild, big lobby full of people, you know, can't see Betty anywhere, but she's so tiny. And so I got Johnny in tow and, you know, we I'm looking and suddenly a couple of guys walk away and say, oh, there's Betty in the midst of that group, you know. And so we go over and she's this Morgan, thank God you're here. What are they going to say to me? They want me to stay now till the end of the movie and people have to walk by me. What if they, what if they want to have to walk by me and they I don't, didn't like it? What do they say? I said, Betty, I'm just going to stand with you. I'm going to stand with you and we'll just talk. We'll pretend they're not even there. If they don't say something nice, if you don't think they liked it, and, you know, we'll just talk. And, you know, so we walk in as we walk up, she says, oh, Margaret, she says, hi, Johnny. Oh, Morgan, what am I going to do? You know, so later it was, it was funny. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, later, after I'd broken up with Johnny, I was I was at a gala at the Hilton, and I, I feel this tap on my shoulder. I turn around, it's Betty, and she just leans over and says, "You were quite right to dump him." <laughs> That's like she was always like right out of a movie. And anyway, after we did the pilot, I had gone off to England to shoot a TV movie, and while I was over there, I heard that Betty wasn't going to be able to do the series. She did the pilot, can't do the series, some big health problem, the, you know, the tabloids are all, is it cancer, is it a stroke, what happened, we don't know. So um, she and Bob Osborne uh, were great friends, and I was great friends with Bob, I love Bob. So I, I sent her flowers, and I sent her a note and everything, and she sent me a note back to England saying, you know, can't believe you heard about my, heard about my problems over the Great Pond. <laughs> so anyway, so I get back to New York and I call Bob and I say, OK, what's wrong? And he says, I'm sworn to secrecy. I can't tell you, uh, he said. But she's at the Lombardi Hotel and I just, you know, call and ask her to go to lunch or tea or something. She won't go, but she would love to be asked. So I said, OK, so I call up in the Lombardi and I said, uh, Betty Davis, please. And they say, oh, well, we have no Miss Davis here. So I'm like, oh. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, if she should happen to check in in the next five minutes, would you ask her to call Morgan Fairchild at this number? I mean, before I could even hang up the phone, the phone rings, it's Betty. And so, <laughs> so, so I don't, you know, I'm like, what do I say? What happened? What do I say? I mean, she just starts off, she says, well, I'll tell you. Having a stroke and breast cancer at the same time is a real bitch. <laughs> it's like, okay, <laughs> you know. And so she was always, uh, you know, just hysterically funny and very forthright. And um, and and that's what I really liked about all the old stars. They were all very practical. They grew up in the studio system, very professional, very practical, very good, you know. And 
you know, it was always a great fun working with them, with Jane Wyman on Falcon Crest, with Betty, with Vincent Price. I did a pilot with him and his uh, and his wife. I mean, just all that Roddy, Natalie. I mean, all of them were fabulous. And R.J. Wagner. I love R.J. So, you know, it was always it was always a joy to get to work with people you'd grown up watching. You know, the more I hear you speak, the more I think, Morgan, it's time for a memoir. You've got to write a <laughs> memoir. These stories are fabulous. I mean, the people, you know, I, I happen to know RJ quite well. He was on our show. He's become a dear friend. Betty Davis's assistant was Catherine Cermak. And she's a very dear friend of mine as well. She's been on the show. And I just think that, you know, you're, you knew people that the rest of the world wish they knew and idolized, but you knew them in a different way. Like, I'm really impressed. I knew that she was very fond of you because Catherine told me that because she saw that Betty Davis felt you were really one of the great actresses. And oh, she, that's nice that she said that. I mean, she that said that would have heard that, you know, she said that I can tell you more. She was not a fan of Faye Dunaway's at all. And she really, really respected your work ethic and your ability to deliver whatever you were asked to do. I'll give you an example. In 1995, you starred in a really fascinating and compelling movie called Gospa. Now, for those people who have not seen that film, it's about a group of kids in Bosnia who claim that the Virgin Mary appeared to them on a hill. The local priest believes them and spreads the word, bringing thousands of people to the area. The communist government doesn't like this and has the priest arrested. And Morgan plays a nun, Sister Fabiana, opposite Martin Sheen. Now, I know you shot the movie in Bosnia during a very tumultuous time in that country. Do you have any memories of making that movie that you can share with us? Oh, honey, have I got memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, a lot of my part from what I, I haven't seen the movie, but a lot of part of my part apparently got cut out from what I've heard. But it was it, it, it's a true story. I mean, Medjugorje is a Catholic pilgrimage place because of these kids seeing visions of the Virgin Mary and uh, Father Yozo, the character that Martin played. Martin is a very devout Catholic and he is a, a love Medjugorje and he wanted to get this movie made. And Michael York is in it, and Paul Guilfoyle, who went on to CSI fame. So we had a really wonderful cast. I and mean, we started off shooting in Zagreb in Croatia. So when I was going to go over, this is like 94, when I was going to go over, you know, people are saying, are you insane? There's a war going on. I said, well, you know, they're not bombing Zagreb. And, you know, and I'm, you know, I counterterrorism and all that stuff. I'm a bit of an adventurer. So I go over and then eventually they wanted to actually shoot in Medjugorje. And I remember they were taking... We were supposed to shoot only in Zagreb. And the producers take everybody to dinner one night to this place that all the uh, UN people go and stuff and for dinner because there was a lot of negotiations going on. And Chinese restaurant. And after they get everybody drunk on the plum brandy, you know, it's like, you know, we must go to Medjugorje. You know, we have shot the exteriors here. We've looked at churches here, but there is no church like Medjugorje. So we must go to Medjugorje and all the castes. Yay. And I'm saying, I don't drink. I'm saying, guys, Medjugorje is in Bosnia. Bosnia is at war. Bosnia is getting bombed. <laughs> you know, so, but but eventually, you know, I agreed to go, you know, and it was quite fascinating being in the middle of a war zone. We don't probably have enough time for me to tell you all the war zones, uh, stories there, but 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 it was uh, quite interesting. Uh, I learned a lot. And as usual, because I like to travel and I like to meet the real people. So I traveled around a lot, went to uh, refugee camps. Uh, uh, our ambassador was Peter Galbraith at the time, and he uh, allowed me to come along to some meetings and stuff and just to observe and then go to refugee places and stuff. And uh, you just learn a lot, meeting all sides. And so that was a fascinating thing, as you know, you'd meet very nice, educated people and having a nice conversation. And suddenly it's Serb and, you know, vampire time. And, you know, it's like whoever the opposition was, but they always liked it. What I, I've discovered, you know, just being someone who reads a lot, that when you do travel, people always appreciate it if you know a little bit about their country. And uh, so a lot of the people we were with over there, 
liked the fact that I knew who the leaders were, ostensibly what the fight was about. I knew Tito's history. I knew a lot of this stuff. And, well, you know, and, and then, you know, the Serb Serbians we dealt with, I would always say with Serbs, they would say, ah, oh, but Morgan, what about the Battle of Kosovo? You know, and I'd say, oh, honey, Battle of Kosovo, 1389, Serbs lost, but it was a glorious loss. And hey, I'm from Texas. Remember the Alamo? You know? <laughs> so, and so they liked the fact that you actually knew them. Morgan, you're OK. You know, and and then they would take you places and show you things. And, you know, God, I, when we were in Medjugorje, I'm, I'm having to dress in the same area with the the guys who were running the rape camps the week before were working as extras on the movie. <laughs> Interesting times. We'll talk sometime. I have a lot of adventures in Bosnia. Okay, so I'm going to repeat it again. You need to write a book. You really do. <laughs> you know, and the other really interesting thing about your career, I find, is that you've starred in a lot of movies with very important pressing social issues. You did Moment of Truth, Into the Arms of Danger. That was about domestic oh, violence. Justice. You did Shattered Illusions, which was about mental health and being stalked. Unshackled dealt with racism. Held for Ransom dealt with kidnapping. Shock to the System dealt with homophobia and gay conversion therapy. I'm just wondering, has it been important to you throughout your career to choose projects that have compelling social messages? You know, I just like to do iconoclastic things. And I, 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 I've spent my life the last few decades like trying to educate people on aids now on long covid trying to educate people so anything i can do to open people's eyes about racism anti-semitism i mean i shot a movie in israel back in 86 i saw a lot of everybody's side of everything over there it's a very complicated issue you know and so yeah i mean i like to do things that make people think because of the way I look and sometimes the parts that I'm actually playing in the movie, sometimes people don't think of it that way that I'm taking on a part that makes them think. But I like to be part of projects that make people think one way or another, even if I'm playing the bad guy who's against everything. <laughs> so, of course, I have to ask you about your most recent TV movie, Ladies of the 80s, A Diva's Christmas co-starring two of my dear friends, Lonnie Anderson and Linda Gray, both of whom were on our show. The movie was just delightful. It looked like you ladies were having so much fun on the set. And when Stan Zimmerman was here uh, last week, he wrote the script. He said that you had to do all that in 15 days and that he thinks they should make a TV series out of the show. What do you think? Well, I, I, was it 15 days? I guess it was. It was really, it was three weeks, but it was three, five working days. <laughs> yeah, 15 days. Yeah. Yeah. And I love all these ladies. You know, Linda and I first met when I was doing, uh, created the Jenna Wade character on Dallas. Lonnie and I had done uh, Bob Hope specials together. Donna and I had done Bob Hope specials together. Nicolette and I did uh, uh, Paper Dolls, my favorite series together. And, you know, and uh, so, I mean, I was the only one that knew everybody. Some of them were meeting for the first time or had only seen each other at affiliate gatherings or something like that. But I was the only one who actually knew everybody. And what a great group of ladies. It was so nice to be together and catch up and, you know, how are the grandkids? What are you doing? And so there was a lot of fun between times just sitting around gabbing and, and seeing how everybody's doing and everything. It was great fun. I love Stan's script. And I, we all wish they would do another one. I don't know if there's any plans to. I mean, but we all wish they'd do another one. We love uh, working together. We love doing it. And I mean, people seem to really like it. I mean, the uh, reaction on my social media, the reaction everywhere we went to do promos, every interview that I did, you know, as, as you know, a lot of times you're talking ahead of time before you actually go on. People had actually seen the movie before we saw the movie, you know, because they were screening it to talk to us. They, you know, they were so excited about it and seemed to really like it. And they don't always do that. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's kind of perfunctory. But no, but it was it was great. And it, it seemed to have gotten such a good reaction. We're all kind of hoping they'll do another. We haven't heard anything about it yet. 
but I I would jump at the chance. I mean, just to hang out with everybody again. We had such fun. Lonnie is such a doll. And Linda's one of the sweetest ladies in town, you know. And Donna is great. And, you know, it was just great catching up with Donna. Uh, you know, it, she's such a uh, an interesting lady and, and so nice, too. I mean, we lucked out. We had such a nice cast. Would you ever consider being a regular in a long-running TV show again? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would actually love it. I mean, I would love to do that again. You know, they don't write too many parts for women my age. And what I find these days is they say, if they want somebody my age, they don't think I look like it. You know, they want a grandma. <laughs> they want a Stel Getty or something. <laughs> you know, they want a grandma. And I think, you know, all of us that were in that movie, we kind of run into that same uh, thing is they have a preconceived idea of what women our age look like. So, yeah, I would no, we would I would love to do another series. I mean, I would I would relish it. Oh, I if hope it's a good happens. one. <laughs> I really hope that happens. Now, I want to ask you about the movie you made with Mariette Hartley and Jerry Soroka called Our Almost Completely True Love Story. There's a scene in that movie where you, Mariette and Tess Harper are at an audition and the three of you are treated in such a demeaning and disrespectful way. How realistic was that scene? Oh, probably pretty realistic. You know, the young people, when you work nowadays, they don't know who any of us are and they don't care. And I love Mariette and Jerry. I mean, and and Tess is great. Actually, I was doing a play in Kansas City in the fall and Tess has moved to, to Missouri. And so we were having long phone chats. I love Tess. But yeah, but a, a lot of it, uh, you know, it depends. Either they know your work and they love you or they have no clue who you are and they and they don't want to know who you are. So it's kind of weird that way. But I take comfort in the fact that fame is a very strange thing. And a few years ago, I <laughs> I was in New York and uh, one of the ladies that I knew in New York was a PR lady. And she we were waiting for her client, who was a friend also. And she had brought this young stock broker, young in his 30s. I mean, they're not children. And uh, so we're waiting for her client and she says, oh, you know, he just loves all your stories, your old Hollywood stories. Why don't you tell some of those like Betty Davis and Cary Grant, Gregory Peck stories, tell those stories. And so I, I started telling a couple of stories and I, I told <laughs> and finally she looks at the guy, the young guy, and she says, you don't know who any of these people are, do you? And he said, no. Well, I, I know that Cary Grant, I've heard of her. Oh. <laughs> And if Cary Grant can be, I've heard of her, you know, who am I? I have to complain. <laughs> you know, we've talked about what you've done for AIDS awareness. And we've talked about your interest in anthropology, paleontology. You're very mm -hmm. interested in antique clothing, movie memorabilia, ballet. Where do you think that natural curiosity comes from and that commitment to public service that you have? Those are the two things that really stand out to me. You know, you're, you're incredibly talented, but you have this natural curiosity. You love to travel. You love to find out what's really going on. You, you do get out of the Hollywood mindset and you really do. You don't discharge from reality. You're actually really in the real world. And then you have this amazing commitment to public service. Where does all that come from? Well, uh, that's all very kind of you to say. I mean, I think you're either born with an insatiable curiosity or you're not. And I mean, ask me about quantum physics, I know nothing. You know, you, you have the things you're interested in. Like when I was doing AIDS, a lot of AIDS work in the mid 80s, you know, I'd be doing interviews and, and people would say, you know more about this than the doctors do. And I'd say, well, yeah, because I'm studying this. They've got practices. They're doing a lot of other stuff. I'm looking at this. <laughs> so. So yeah, you try to you try to find things that interest you, and I've just always gotten interested by a lot of things. When you say, like you asked earlier, you know, who are your mentors or who inspired you? Uh, it's not the usual people. I'm I was in love with ballet because of Rudolf Nureyev. When I was sixteen, I saw a film of Romeo and Juliet with Rudolf Nureyev and Margot Fontaine, and it gave me hope I could get out of Texas. And at that point, being a teenager in Texas, it seemed all anybody cared about was cheerleaders and drill team and football, and I didn't care about that. And I, uh, the beauty of that, gave me 
the hope that there was that kind of beauty somewhere in the world. I could get to New York. I could find it. And I was fortunate to get to see Nureya dance many, many times and and meet him many times. And he was a god to me. When he died of AIDS, it was it gave me some small joy that I had worked so hard on AIDS. And, and that's what killed my idol. The person you said, are you ever starstruck? Rudolf Nureyev, totally starstruck and adored him. And then when I was uh, in New York in 73, I went to see Enter the Dragon. And, you know, I, I, I it was playing in Times Square. Well, actually, my sister and I took my mother in Dallas to see Enter the Dragon. We said, oh, mom, this is a rage in New York. Let's go see Enter the Dragon. Well, I became mesmerized by the total focus of energy of Bruce Lee in that. And I went back to New York. He had already passed away at that point, but I became I love Bruce Lee. And so every movie he made and then went back to New York and spent until I moved here, spent the next several years taking Kung Fu in Chinatown several nights a week. And and I was always beat up, even on Search for Tomorrow. All my arms were black and blue from all the, you know, katas that you do and stuff. And uh, they knew they knew they could never put me <laughs> in short sleeves. <laughs> but and and then um and then when I was 14, I went to see James Brown. And this was a time when James Brown had not done crossover yet. So I was one of the few white kids in the audience. And he threw me his scarf. And I have uh, friends of mine from high school who saw me, you know, James Brown loves you, you know. And but I would always run into James. I don't know that he ever remembered that, but we became friends. And he would, uh, you know, like if we go to, you know, we'd be at the House of Blues and he'd send his wife out to come and say, come, come to the green room, come to the green room, talk, you know. And um, I'd run into him like even when I was doing Search for Tomorrow, he'd be doing some show there and I'd see him at the elevator and would always gab. And we became friends. And, you know, even even toward the end, I was when I was doing a big tour of The Graduate and we were playing all over the United States and then uh, for the we were going up like Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, and then we're over in Saskatchewan, Canada. And and um, and it's freezing, it's cold and it's miserable. And uh, anyway, but I come in and uh, check in and everything and uh, at the dressing rooms and then the, the bulletin board is there and it says, oh, my God, James Brown's playing tonight. So and I said, oh, where is uh, where is the security guard that we usually have? Oh, oh, he's doing the James Brown concert. I said, well, can you know, can can he can you get him on the phone? Get him on the phone. I said, can you get James road manager? Because I want to bring over my cast after we finish our show, come over and catch the end of James show. So they come in and they say, oh, sure, you know. So anyway, so I get everybody in cabs on the ice. We all go over to the Coliseum and walk in. It's a big open flat floor thing. And James is up there riffing and the stage man, the manager comes over and says, oh, James is waiting for you to get here. And then they take me over. He said, James wants you to get up on the stage and dance with him. And I said, I'm not going to get up on stage and dance with James Brown. Are you insane? And no, no. And, and he, they're riffing and, you know, the stage is raised and we're down on the ground. And James say, come on up, come on up. You know, and they're riffing. I know they're riffing. <laughs> no. So finally, Finally, I go up and some fan has somewhere took a picture of me up there dancing with James Brown. And I told I called my sister later. I said, I can die happy now having danced with James Brown. But, but that was that night we went backstage. And that's when he told me that he had cancer and everything. And, and in spite of that, spent 45 minutes with my cast from The Graduate signing autographs and doing the whole thing. And, you know, just, you know, the greatest guy in the world to me, every every time I would ever see him, it was like we were old friends and hadn't seen each other in two hours. You know, he was he was great. But this all comes to my inspirations on stage, what I always aspire to on stage, focus of energy, James Brown, Bruce Lee and Rudolph Nureyev. Total focus of energy. You cannot take your eyes off of them when they're on film or on stage. And that those were my inspirations. Maybe not my mentors, but my inspirations. <laughs> now do you see why I think you should write a book? Look at the stories. <laughs> Look at these experiences you've had. Now, I, I can't have an interview with you without mentioning that, because I know all of your fans are very much wanting me to ask you, we know that you lost your beloved life partner and fiance Mark Seller last July. How have you been doing? Well, um, it's been very hard. You know, we were together 36 years 
And the last few years, Mark had had Parkinson's. And anybody who is a caretaker for someone with any neurodegenerative disease, you know, it, uh, you know, it's not going to get better. You just try to stave it off as best you can for as long as you can. And, you know, Mark always said that he was very fortunate that I was a science nerd because I did all this research on everything and I had him on vitamin therapies and all kinds of therapies. And he always said, I wouldn't have lived this long if it weren't for you. And also, you know, I visited every day. I took him when he could still walk. I took him out to lunch every day. I, you know, I took him home to visit the cats on the weekend. I tried really hard to give him the best life that he could have for as long as he could have it. And the unfortunate thing is that in the nursing homes, he kept catching COVID. And after the first COVID, I couldn't really tell that much difference. After the second COVID, he couldn't walk anymore. It's totally different than the freezing up and falling of Parkinson's. Suddenly there was no muscle. It was just imploding. And then the third one, he went in the hospital last spring. And six weeks later, he was dead of heart attacks, which is long COVID. So all the work I did on long COVID actually couldn't save him. But I keep trying to save other people so they don't go through the things that they're not being educated about, about what it does to your body. That I wish the government and everybody would educate people more about it so they'd try to avoid catching it. Thank you to everybody. People have been so gracious and uh, so kind about Mark, and I really appreciate it. And, you know, it was a long haul. Uh, he was sick for a long time. And it just kept getting worse. But, you know, you're still not prepared when it's heart attack suddenly. You're, you're prepared for this long haul of slow degradation. You're not prepared for the sudden going. Uh, and he died like literally a week to the day after we finished the Christmas movie. So so it's been hard. But, and but you know, for me, I, I say a prayer. Thank you, God, because I, I had a play to go to. It got me out of town. It got me away from here. It got me out of the condo and, you know, off having to concentrate on something else and gave me something else to to do and feel useful. And so I'm very grateful that I had work to go to and a cast that was very warm and supportive and lovely and producers that I love in Kansas City. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. But yeah, it's been a hard year. And then Bob Edwards is a friend. He just died this weekend from Morning Edition on NPR Paul Rubens, I lost this year, I, you know, Pee Wee Herman, Suzanne Summers, we lost this year, we were friends, Matthew Perry, we lost this year. It's been kind of a rough year, you know, so, so, you know, you just keep putting your foot in front of, you know, one foot in front of the other and, you know, saying thank you that I'm still here and I have my health and I have work and, you know, that you know that whatever, whatever you could do for them was done and that you never look back and think, oh God, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I visit more often? Why didn't I say this? And, you know, everything was done. Everything was said. Every visit was had. So, you know, you take some small comfort in that. And thank you so much for, for conveying those wishes. I appreciate it. Well, I hope you know that there's a lot of love around you, that we all wish you well. I, I have to tell you, it's been such an incredible pleasure meeting you and 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 an honor I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. And I, I wish you the very, very best. I hope we see you in a lot more movies and TV shows because Betty Davis was right. You're fabulous. Oh, you're kind. You're kind. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our guest has been the incomparable actress, author, social justice advocate, and humanitarian Morgan Fairchild. You can learn more about Ms. Fairchild by going to her official website, morganfairchild.com. You can also follow her on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistants, Rosa Puzo and Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.